Welcome to EVTN News, your source for um, the new springtime. Uh, your what is it? The new springtime news. Uh, the new Advent news. I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> how about how about the uh, the Pachum? No, not Pachamama News Network. Um, I, I don't really know. Catholic Social Teaching News Network. I don't know that. Um, we're gonna we're going straight to a German bishop though. He wants you to confess your climate sins. And so his name is Bishop Rolf Lohmann of the Munster Diocese. Um, he said it is right to confess sins against the environment. More important than words or true repentance, the willingness to repent and the honest effort not to repeat a sin committed, the church should set a good example in this field and inspire people for environmental protection and the preservation of creation. Uh, he said no one doubts that repentance is necessary and it will not work without uh, conversion and repentance. This is precisely where the sacrament of penance comes in. All right. So you, you guys are going to um, convert, you, you're, going, you're going to have a conversion um, in regards to ecology and uh, an environmental conversion and repentance. Confess our eco-sins, exactly what's going to inspire people with this new springtime, right? Uh, we'll get more into that as we go along, because this new springtime is... Uh, you know, it feels more like winter. Cardinal Gretsch, Cardinal Mario Gretsch, said he did not agree with the method used by the critics of the German synodal, synodal way. Um, he is the secretary for the Synod of Bishops, and he said he disapproved of the style. He said, I think a fraternal correction and dialogue is very positive, but why a public denunciation? It doesn't help. It only polarizes further. Gretsch also said he could not say why there was this criticism of the process, meaning the German synodal way. So it sounds a lot like Mario, Cardinal Mario Gretsch agrees with the German synodal way because he said, oh, you can, you can, uh, you can have a fraternal correction and dialogue, but don't denounce them. Okay, so there's at least like four heresies cardinal of the church, he should be denouncing them, but he's denouncing the people that are denouncing them. So that's what we got. That's what we have. Okay. The, uh, okay, this is, this is a building, the Bridge Eco Village, Bridge Eco Village, which is located in a building that was once the Bishop McDevitt High School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, has announced a haunted attraction in partnership with a company called Rotten Concepts. The attraction will be called the Unholy Schoolhouse and plays into the building's past as a parochial school under the Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg. The event page for the Unholy Schoolhouse mentions that the attraction will include demonic nuns and damned teachers and that visitors will be risking not only your life but your faith and your very souls. So, nice to see uh, formerly, former church property being used for demonic, um, uh, demonic entertainment. Uh, it's too bad that, uh, well, well, I don't know. Good thing that these bishops don't sell any property to the SSPX. They would rather sell them to demon worshippers. Okay. Big story. Uh, Bishop Barron. In an interview with Fox News, he said, One of my dreams is to establish an order of priests. Go back to the Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits. They all responded to a need of their time, what they perceived to be this pressing spiritual need. Uh, we have mostly lay people. It's a mostly online presence, but we want to set this thing up institutionally and establish word on fire centers in all the major cities. The centers would be centers of evangelization, instruction of liturgy, that would then influence the wider culture. Uh, he said, so I would dream of an order of priests who would share my charism, which is, you know, teaching and preaching using the media, 
engaging the culture. So that's his dream. That's Bishop Barron's dream religious order, the word on fire religious order. Because it's Novus Ordo, I mean, I don't see any reason why, if he pursued that, that, that if, if he pursued the idea of a word on fire religious order, I don't see any reason why the Vatican would not accept it. It's Novus Ordo. I mean, how many people are entering Novus Ordo um, religious orders? <laughs> Take a look at the uh, decline in religious after Vatican II. Uh, nuns are particularly awful. Um, I think they're like 20 percent of the nuns that there there were in uh like what 1965 or so it's it's bad um basically after vatican ii people quit just very few people joined convents for nuns um priests it's still bad i think it's at least uh i don't know is it a 50 percent decline i don't know uh, there's you know it's pretty sad now Bishop Barron says that uh, these religious orders all responded to a need of their time. What is a need in our time? And I don't think he says a lot about it. He just talks about evangelization, instruction. Um, I, I honestly think he sees a need as, like, social media. He sees that as a need in the church. And I mean, we can evangelize through social media, like that's how we spread the idea of the Latin Mass. That's how we, you know, that's how we evangelize to other people. But um, I think this this religious order would have a bench press limit, or a limit, a, a bench press requirement. So I'd have to bulk up, you know, I'd have to use my supplements and do it, go, go into a heavy lifting program. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Google or search on YouTube my video, uh, word on fire workout and see see uh, what it is basically all of Bishop Barron's employees are very big uh, bodybuilders including the one pre the, there's a priest and word on fire Father Steve I think is what his name is he's pretty bulked up and Bishop Barron himself is, is uh, you know pretty bulked up as well um, <clears throat> using the media so he dreams of an order of priests who would use the media, engage in the culture. Um, I think we need less e-priests, to be quite honest about that. Um, you know, and, and what do I mean by e-priests? Well, if you go on Twitter, some of you are on Twitter, some are not, but you know what I'm talking about. There's these priests that seem to be on Twitter all day, and they seem to comment consistently on any, everything and any, anything. Um, how do you have so much time to be on Twitter? I'm a single layman, and I don't even have that kind of time to be on Twitter. I'd rather be reading spiritual readings or whatever, um, spending time outside. You know, I, I don't go to, for a walk and tweet while I'm walking. Like, it's just, to me, I don't see how they find the time to use Twitter so much. Um, and really, is it helping? Is it helping evangelize, or is it just making them look bad? The e-priests. You know, a lot of them are different. There are some LMNOP Jesuits on Twitter. Um, understand. A lot of Jesuits on Twitter. Hmm. Um, spending too much time on social media is effeminate. Hmm. I don't know, are those last two statements that I made, are they connected? All right, going, moving over, speaking of LMNOP. Uh, after waiting for over an hour at the Holy See Press Office in the Vatican to ask the San Diego Cardinal McElroy some hard questions regarding his silence on McCarrick and other controversial topics, LifeSite News Rome correspondent Louis uh, Nufke was told by Vatican Press Office that Cardinal McElroy was refusing an interview with LifeSite. The Cardinal did not give a reason to the press office and had gladly granted interviews to other news outlets that morning. Sure, if they're friendly towards him, they will, right? That's how it works. After the ceremonies to the newly appointed Cardinals at St. Peter's Basilica, which McElroy received the red hat from Pope Francis. Nufki approached the Cardinal to greet him 
introducing himself as a native California and asking if the Cardinal would be willing to answer an interview question or arrange for a future meeting. The Cardinal refused. That's pretty bold. Nufke then told the prelate that his background was in education and that being from California, it is a concern of the faithful that the church is not observing California law and covering up and moving around priests who are guilty of sexual abuse. McElroy refused to address the topic. When told that the church needs the truth, the cardinal retorted, well, they'll find it elsewhere than life site news, to which Nufke replied, how about in your offices? So, confrontation there. Um, yeah, they won't be getting an interview with McElroy, but good effort. <laughs> I don't think, I don't, especially after uh, George Newmeyer, whenever uh, he went up to Cardinal Tobin, he just walked up at a USCCB meeting and he asked him, uh, he, uh, George Newmeyer asked Cardinal Tobin, is there any truth to the rumor that there's an Italian male model living in your rectory? And Cardinal Tobin just said, yeah. And they didn't know who George was at the time, but now... All the McCarrick Cardinals, I'm sure they circulated the memo, and now no one talks to him. Uh, he was doing he was doing some good work until the memo went around. Don't talk to this guy. He's uh, he's on to us. And um, McElroy knows who his friends are, and he knows who his enemies are. His enemies are Catholics. If you're Catholic, you're an enemy of McElroy, or vice versa. If, uh, okay, anyway, moving on uh, to Ireland, Bishop Alphonsus Collinan of the Waterford and Lismore Diocese of Ireland, uh, he wrote a, a reflection, I guess it would, it would be, uh, open letter, whatever you call it, about the Synod. I'm um, just reading just a few clips here. He said, like many others, I felt the synodal process itself was somewhat rushed. The time limitation given by those tasked to oversee the synod in Rome was insufficient. Okay, so here we go. We have a cardinal or a, a bishop who's speaking his mind, and uh, it's, it's not what the Vatican would want to hear. He said the synthesis, um, talking about the synthesis of the synodal reactions. He says the synthesis also reveals an attitude of what could be termed traditional faith, which is mildly dismissive or uh, sorry, it reveals an attitude to what could be termed traditional faith, which is mildly, mildly dismissive. From my own interaction with some conservative or traditional believers, it was clear that many did not engage with the synodal process at the parish level. It would be interesting to research why this was so. Is it because they themselves feel marginalized, or because they felt that church teaching cannot be changed, and that there was no need for this synodal process, and that little fruit would ensue? Or perhaps they felt simply that uh, they had better things to do with their time. These are all questions to ponder. If the church in Ireland is worried about groups on the margins of society, then we will have to dialogue in a more serious way uh, with what might be termed traditional Catholics. Wow, this bishop has his head on straight. I respect that. Uh, in Ireland, the faith is... The faith is uh, plummeting. It's, it's really declined. And here's a bishop saying, hey, <laughs> I mean, we need to reach out to the traditional Catholics because they believe in the Catholic faith. There you go. There's your answer. He's asking these questions. Why is the Vatican not asking these questions? All right, so there's not a lot of news from the consistory of cardinals. I am going to read a few of the headlines there. But uh, a lot of people thought Pope Francis might resign. Didn't happen. Um, he thought they thought maybe there would be some kind of um, conclave, like voting rolls for the next pope that would change. But uh, Cardinal Brandmuller had a reaction on this. Uh, he said the experience of recent years has been entirely different uh, from, I guess, previous consistories. He said at the consistories convened almost exclusively for the causes of saints. Forms were distributed to request speaking time, followed by obviously spontaneous remarks on any sort of topic, and that was it. There has never been a debate and exchange of arguments on a specific topic, obviously a completely useless procedure. A suggestion presented to the Cardinal Dean 
to communicate a topic for discussion in advance so that remarks could be prepared went unanswered. In short, for at least eight years, the consistories have ended without any form of dialogue. So it's in and out. All right, we're, this is going to be a formality, and then uh, we don't care about your opinion. See you later. So there you go. Um, Cardinal Brandmuller was one of the dubia cardinals, so he should be used to that by now, and it seems like he is. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> we talk about the faith declining in Ireland. Well, also in the Netherlands. Rocketing energy bills and a shortage of priests have driven a Dutch Roman Catholic diocese to cut down on religious services in some churches. This is from U.S. News, um, which means masses. They're cutting down on masses. The southern diocese of Roermond, which oversees roughly 290 churches in the province of Limburg, wrote to its parishes last week to encourage some to periodically skip mass. Spokesman Matthew Bel Belmonds, Be Bemelmonds said on Thursday. He said, uh, finances cannot be a dominant factor, but we cannot ignore them either. If you only have a handful of people donating a euro, that's not enough to cover the heating bill. Uh, the measure was initially expected to affect 10 to 15 churches. So <laughs> the diocese is encouraging priests to skip mass. So, all right, skip mass to save energy, just to save money on energy costs. Well... It's starting to hurt. The, uh, the lack of donations are starting to hurt. And I don't want any of my money to go to a diocese, quite honestly. I mean, what, what does a diocese do for you? They ban you from the sacraments if you have a bad bishop. Or even a bishop that's decent. They might ban you from the old right sacraments. So why should you donate any money to the diocese? Donate it to a monastery and the SSPX. Until the bishops wake up, it's starting to hurt. You can see it in the Netherlands. I mean, it's not going to make a huge impact, and it's not going to make an immediate impact, but eventually it'll sink in. When we're the only people that still go to Mass, they're going to hear us. The money's going to speak. The money talks. All right, Cardinal Mueller had an interview. Uh, the, there was a question, question and answers. I'll read just a few of these. One of the questions, do you think that uh, Cardinal Zen has been abandoned to his fate because he is an unwieldy character, given that he defends Chinese Catholics belonging to the clandestine church not aligned with the Communist Party? Is there something else going on? Cardinal Mueller said, I hope he will not be abandoned. The extraordinary consistory would have been an opportunity to declare full solidarity with Zen on behalf of all the cardinals of the college. The question, instead what happened? Cardinal Mueller said, nothing at all. There are obviously political reasons on the part of the Holy See that prevent such initiatives. I refer to the agreement for the renewal of bishops signed recently with the Xi government. I'm sorry to say it, but we cannot subject the interests of the Holy See and the Vatican State to the Ecclesial Dimension and Truth. So there you go. And then the question, uh, the, person, the interviewer asks, Excuse me, but were there, but there were over 200, 200 cardinals of the consistory. Couldn't they have taken the initiative for a common document of solidarity on their own? Cardinal Mueller said, There was no opportunity. Well, I mean, we knew that from the Brand Mueller um, statement. Uh, it is not part of the tradition, and perhaps with this internal climate, no one feels like it. There were some exchanges that, yes, uh, but only some of us. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we weren't able to do anything else because there was a time, there was the time tied up with the working groups, and there was not so much time available. And perhaps we, they were all too busy singing the praises of an apostolic constitution already in force, and now unmodifiable text that has never been submitted to the Cardinal College of Cardinals for scrutiny. I say this ironically with a hint of bitterness. It is as if we are being treated like first semester students, as if we needed to be indoctrinated, but I don't want to make controversy. I mean, I think it's too late to say that. 
I don't want to make controversy. Well, guess what? If you're not standing up for the Catholic, if you stand up for the Catholic faith, you're controversial, right? Bishop Strickland opposes Pope Francis on the jabs. If you oppose Pope Francis on the jabs, then you might as well oppose the uh, not the uncatholic ideas of Pope Francis. Paganism, communion for divorced and remarried, um, capital punishment, go down the list. All right, and another person. Uh, well, Father James Martin is in good favor with Pope Francis, and he attacked Bishop DeGroote on Twitter. So, uh, quoting De Bishop Donald DeGroote of the Diocese of Sioux Falls, South Dakota's pastoral guidelines, which ban Catholic students from advocating, celebrating, and expressing LMNOP attraction, um, and boys who pretend to be girls and vice versa, Mart uh, Father Martin said, People should be able to and encouraged to celebrate who they are and, more importantly, how God made them, including LMNOP people. And uh, anytime, because Father James Martin has, uh, there are a few, like, so-called Catholics who follow him, but I think most of the people that follow him are atheists or um, non-Catholics, I would say. He, but he has quite a following, and so anytime... Uh, he attacks a bishop. His his uh, his fanatics who some who who could be demon possessed. They you know send their legions to the to, to the chanceries of these you know solid bishops, and they attack these bishops um, on social media. They post uh, potentially pornographic like LMNOP. Um, photos and uh, they, they just I think they, they swarmed uh, what's his name? The Good Tobin the Good Tobin, Bishop Tobin of Rhode Island he uh, he made a statement against the LMNOP and he got brutally attacked by the LMNOPs it was, it was very sad and he apologized which is embarrassing he shouldn't he shouldn't have but I think there may have been threats so he backed down to the woke mob. But, uh, you know, the Catholic faith is the Catholic faith. And LMNOP, celebrating LMNOP is um, contrary to the Catholic faith, as St. Paul says. I believe it's in Romans. He says, he, he says it in no uncertain terms. All right, we're going to move on. Pope John Paul I. So the, the young woman who is miraculously healed... Uh, they say, through the intercession of Pope John Paul I, did not attend his beatification in Rome Sunday as planned, and many others chose not to attend the ceremony as the crowd was rather sparse. It was not; in, it was a very small crowd. Um, there's no public, uh, what do you say, no public following or what you would call like a cult. Um, I, and I wouldn't; I don't mean cult as in like a false religion. It's like, you know, the cult of Pope. Uh, St. Pius X, they have followers. Um, a saint has like a cult, uh, cultists or whatever it is. Uh, if, if, someone ha if, if someone who's lived a holy life has a following, then you know, that's, that's how the typical uh, canonization process would go. They would say, oh, okay, there's, there's devotion to this uh, individual. People are praying for their intercession. There's miracles. What, maybe we should investigate this, but now it's like, all right, someone has a bunch of money and throws it, and they say, oh, let's look at the, let's look into this. Uh, when when John Paul II was pope, uh, anytime he would go to visit somewhere, he would say, oh, who's a, a you know, someone who has the, the people that the local people have devotion to, and let me um, you know investigate their uh, them for sainthood. And it turns out that most of them were canonized as saints. Just happened to be. Uh, isn't that a coincidence? But this is a larger. Uh, this is a larger topic. Now, John Paul I was pope for 33 days until he was allegedly poisoned, and um, he didn't really do a whole lot in 33 days because really no pope has a chance to do a whole lot in 33 days. Um, now. Was he martyred? I don't know. Was he martyred? 
Uh, that's, that's definitely a lot more likely. But either way, uh, it may have had to do with the Vatican Bank. And what it comes down to is this is a canonization of Vatican II. And so John Paul II had a big following. I mean, he was all over the media, um, TV. He traveled all over the world. And people even called him Pope John Paul the Great. Why? Because he was Pope for so long? <laughs> I mean, really, though. Um, he allowed altar girls, the CC meeting, McCarrick. Uh, he named a lot of rotten cardinals, including McCarrick and Bergoglio, and um, go down the list. St. Gall and Mafia. <clears throat> I don't mean I don't I don't mean to go on this tangent or anything, but um, he had a following. Let's just say he had a following, um, and I think people are starting to wake up at this point. And realize, eh, I mean, there are some good and some bad things. But uh, regardless, Pope Francis canonized him. And, uh, yeah, so at the same time, John the 23rd was canonized. So he snuck, he snuck in John the 23rd. A year later, a year later, a few years later, he canonized Paul the Sixth. And I'm, I'm not quite sure how many popes have been canonized. I can easily look it up. There have been a certain number of popes canonized. The first, uh, like 30 to 50, I think a major, mo almost all of them were canonized saints. Um, so mo many of them were martyrs. Then after that, there were very few popes that were canonized saints. So in the last over a thousand years, there were not a lot of canonized saints, but when it came, came to Vatican II, canonized all the popes, except Benedict, because he brought back the old mass. He won't be canonized. Even from the traditionalists, once we, um, you know, once, once Catholicism returns to Rome, Benedict will not be canonized by the traditionalists. No one really, I mean, ne neither side likes the heretics or the, the Catholics, uh, neither side really, um, has a has a very extremely favorable opinion of of Benedict. Um, so there's that. Let me get to the comments. Okay. So oh yeah, Labor Day in the United States. In honor of Labor Day, I labored doing a lot of laundry. Yeah, same here. I was busy on the weekend, so I did. Sometime this month, I'm having some Amish made bedside tables, and I needed to clean up my room. Good. Greetings from the... Utah's a cool place. Really is. Barron's winsome order of bodybuilders. There you go. Maybe James Martin will join it, right? Will James Martin at least give Barron an endorsement? Return the favor? Remember, Bar Bishop Barron endorsed uh, Father James Martin's book, and someone... Someone commented on one of my videos. I don't, I don't normally, I mean, I don't normally worry about comments, but this person, they said, oh, well, you know, that's not, that doesn't mean that Barron supports Father James Martin. Really? Would you, would you give an endorsement to a book written by, like, a Protestant that is against Catholicism? I mean, come on. Like, would you, so, Joel Olstein, would you give an endorsement for Joel Olstein's book, any of you? No? Okay, well there you go. Because he's not Catholic, he's against the faith. Father James Martin is against the faith, so even if his book doesn't say anything heretical, why would you give him an endorsement if you're not his friend? If you don't support him as a person? Would uh, Bishop Barron give an endorsement for Taylor Marshall's book? Why not? The answer is obviously no, but why wouldn't he? Because they don't agree. They don't agree on theology. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think? Okay, if it wasn't for the need for air conditioning, they could probably do mass by candlelight. Oh, the, um, the Dutch. I don't think it's air conditioning. I think it's going to be heat. The, the, the heating bills are going to be pretty high. They're, they're um, pretty far up north. Uh, I donate to the FSSP. They have the North American Seminary in 
Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I think I don't think I don't think the seminary gives money to the diocese, but um Look, I mean, if your diocese has an element of P group or anything like that, if they're still if they're doing like this wacko catechesis, what do you what is the diocese doing? What are they spending money on? I mean, they have all these people, all these employees. Um, they have an evangelization department in most dioceses. They're paying people. They're a lot of churches are paying um, faith formation directors. Okay. Does that make sense? What's the success rate? Does, does, are they paying a youth director? If they're paying a youth director, how many of those youth stay Catholic after they turn 18? That's your, that's your level of success. If it's less than 50%, why are you paying that person? Someone could drive them away for free. Someone could drive them out of the church for free. You're paying someone so that your youth can leave the church? Makes no sense. JP2 also brought God back to Poland. Yeah, under communism. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There, I mean, like I said, there's all kinds of positives and negatives. I don't think Bishop Connolly allows LMNOP groups. His uh, predecessor, Bishop Bruce Skowitz, put the hammer down on several things, excommunicated people. Yeah, that's what we need. We need more Bishop Grisitas. Um Bishop Strickland hasn't excommunicated anyone. He should. Um, he's he's said, said some pretty strong things on Twitter. I wish he would take some action. Corleone, finally, put his money where his mouth is and, kicked, and, and banned Pelosi from communion. Unfortunately, his counterpart in uh, Delaware or wherever, wherever, uh, whoever the bishop is, didn't ban Biden from communion, and the Jesuit priests still give him communion. The Jesuits are very friendly towards Biden. You know why? I'll bet there's some nice government money flowing in. But the Jesuits, I mean, they run a lot of universities. Those are funded by the government, and they're all about the LMNOPs. They're right in line with the Democrat policies. They're not in line with the Catholic policies, but that's beside the point. All right. Um, okay, one, one last thing I want to mention. I heard... So I, I don't know how I want to approach this. I was passed information, um, obviously source of a source, whatever, that the diocesan Latin masses... Uh, each bishop, the di each diocese has received a directive from Rome to phase out diocese and Latin masses. Now, um, that has been verified in at least one diocese, and I don't know the rest, but it would make sense uh, if you remember Bishop, uh, what, Burbage from Arlington, Virginia, um, what he did with his, with his Latin masses. It would make sense... Uh, the actions of Cardinal Gregory and Cardinal Supich, and they are very close to the people in Rome. They're, uh, they're, they're the golden boys in Rome. So that, it would make sense. It would make sense if that's true. And so if, if your diocesan Latin mass gradual, is gradually getting squeezed out, if it's not yet, plan on it. Get a game plan. What's your backup plan? Because eventually, that might be the case. They might be phased out. So I just wanted to pass along that information. I'm not 100% sure if it's true, but it's been definitely verified in one diocese that that's going to be the case. There is a diocesan Latin mass that's going to be pushed out. All right, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for watching. This has been EVTN News. Until next time, we are the laity, and we will not be silent.